Good afternoon. I'm, I'm glad to see you all here and uh, up and ready to uh, participate in the deep dive focused on legislative and policy controls for asbestos containing materials. I do want to uh, uh, just state the objectives of this hour long uh, effort uh, is to inform, persuade and get recommitment by participating countries of the importance of a legislative uh, regulatory framework within uh, a country to address the impacts of asbestos containing materials in the environment. We're, we're fortunate to have a, a, an esteemed and, and uh, a very well experienced group of presenters. And so let's get, let's get to it. Um, I do wanna say, however, that if you do have any uh, questions or comments, please do use the chat function, uh, write them in the chat and we'll get to them um, at the end of uh, the presentations. We won't be um, actually spending time after each presentation. We'll be having a final Q&A at the very end of all three presentations. So let me go ahead and start. Um, the, our first presenter is Paul Finch, uh, who is um, the uh, Vice President of the Nauru Chamber of Commerce, uh, as well as Managing Director of Central Meriden Incorporated. Uh, he's going to talk to us about the code of practice, uh, why it's a critical component um, um, in approaching and dealing with legacy, legacy asbestos-containing materials. Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Um, now, was someone putting up my screen for me? And I'll just talk through the various PowerPoints. Confirm that, or are we going to try just, what did we have? There we go, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> let's have a look at this. Policy controls for asbestos containing materials particularly asking what is a code of practice. Code of practice, what is a cr critical component of a country's approach to dealing with legacy asbestos containing, ma containing materials? It's the issue that we need to be looking at. It's important that any proposed code of practice is easily under understood able to be implemented by locally skilled staff, is cost efficient, has the full support of all relevant local and regional agencies, has quality oversight and management of training and processes, it does not become a political football. It's integrated into all aspects of health and safety, building codes and practices on the island, and there is a clearly defined end goal in sight. These are critical issues in development of it. Um, steps in the development of a code of practice. Need for public awareness and education. Uh, local construction codes to confirm that no asbestos products are to be used. It must develop awareness of other suitable products to replace ACM materials. It must develop an awareness of protection and management of existing asbestos products still in use on buildings. Um, all sectors of the economy should be included and involved. And there's a need to highlight the benefits of asbestos product removal as part of it. Um, you can have the local and regional legislation, you can have funds committed, you can have public awareness of the potential problems, but the suitable code of practice detailing how you're going to remove and dispose of asbestos materials is imperative for the success of the goal of reducing disease from ACMs. 
There are two further very important factors that must be considered as part of the issue of dealing with legacy ACMs. The long-term disposal of asbestos products and suitable replacement of products, particularly roof sheeting. That needs to be looked at. Asbestos containing materials are evident in most Pacific Island countries. It's the asbestos fibers when they become airborne from these products have the potential to cause serious lung disease or cancer. It's for the long-term benefit of these countries that the vast majority of asbestos containing materials be removed and replaced with more suitable and safer products. It's imperative that a specific comprehensive code of practice for this removal be developed and undertaken. It's imperative that the code of practice includes correct disposal and, and ideally the total removal from each of the islands in, involved. And the development of these codes of practice and processes require a regional and in some form an international approach. I'd like to thank you for the time and uh, look forward to questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And now we will move on to uh, our next presenter. Uh, our next presenter is Justine Ross. She's the Chief Executive Officer of the Asbestos Safety and Eradication Agency uh, for the Australian government. Um, and she's coming uh, to us uh, from Australia. And she's going to touch on uh, the importance of uh, regulation uh, to reduce and of course eventually eliminate uh, both the trade in asbestos containing materials and of course the objective is to reduce and eliminate disease. So Justine, please. Hey, thanks on that. So I can just bear with me while I also share my screen. Okay. All right, I think that's all, all good now. Can someone give me a thumbs up if, if it is? All Great. good. Okay, um, so I guess um, I'm really talking about the laws that need to be in place that will um, support a code of practice. Um, so I was gonna start by just telling you a little bit about my agency and Australia's national strategic plan for um, asbestos. Um, I'll then go over what are the main regulatory frameworks that are required to be put in place to, to ban asbestos and also ban its use. And I also want to touch on the main international conventions and other instruments that can be drawn on to, to underpin sovereign laws. So just to start to tell you a little bit about my agency. Um, so we were established in 2013 to administer the Asbestos National Strategic Plan. Um, we are the only standalone uh, government agency we think in the world that is just dedicated to asbestos safety. Um, we're not a regulator. Our key function is to coordinate and um, monitor the implementation of the National Strategic Plan. And the aim of the plan is to prevent exposure to asbestos fibres in order to eliminate asbestos related diseases in, in Australia. Um, so you may be wondering why we actually have a, um, a national strategic plan and, and if it's important. Well, in a, you know, we have it in Australia for two reasons. Um, in a country like Australia, it is important because we need to coordinate um, actions across the Federation. Um, ensuring that the Commonwealth government and the, the state and territory governments are all working towards a shared purpose. But we also think it's important within a, within a jurisdiction, so even within a country that doesn't have a federated system, that because asbestos issues do involve a range of government agencies, um, it is necessary to have a mechanism that brings all those government agencies together, as well as non-government organisations, um, to ensure that their actions are coordinated 
um, and also to, to reduce um, duplication of effort um, as well. So just moving on to what I see broadly as the, the legislative um, framework around asbestos. Um, it is comprehensive um, in countries like Australia, it's very comprehensive. Um, there is a system of laws, regulations, um, and guide codes and guidance, the codes that Paul, the codes that Paul was speaking about, and that can be across workplace, public health, environmental protection, um, and the transportation of dangerous goods, and also um, very important, um, the customs law, so um, important export. So, what we see is essential and, and what we sort of ad advise um, countries that do not have already have this framework in place is that there are two real, real key bans that need to be put in place. Um, one ban, of course, is to, to stop the, the manufacture and use. And this ban can be enacted through workplace laws like it is in Australia. Um, it'd be also possible to enact that ban through public health laws. Um, that if you wanted it to operate more broadly, so outside the, the workplace context. Um, the other ban um, is maybe the first ban that gets put in place and that's to stop asbestos being entering the country. And this ban is enacted through custom laws and it can be done so by including asbestos and asbestos containing materials as a prohibited important export. Once those bans in place, it is possible to then develop the guidance and other laws um, that need to be put in place to, to deal with, with the legacy. Um, I've just sort of slipped, just, sorry, go back to that slide, skipped ahead of myself. Um, but it, it sort of goes without saying, I think this is really important, it's how extensive these laws need to be really depend on the nature of that legacy. Um, unfortunately, in Australia, um, legacy, the legacy is enormous. Um, so, and we have, that's why we have a very extensive range of laws dealing with it. So just moving on to the important export laws. So I thought it was, um, would be useful for this presentation to sort of point out, as I said at the beginning, like the, the key international um, instruments that can underpin these sovereign laws. Um, that we have the, the Rotterdam Convention, um, of, of course, um, and it deals all types of asbestos, um, apart from chrysotile, are, are listed on Annex 3 of the Rotterdam Convention. Um, however, it should be noted just because chrysotile is not listed on the convention, that does not prevent countries making decisions, national decisions, either the, them administrative or legislative decisions, not to not to import. Um, asbestos at any time. So, and then I thought it was handy to point out what we see the key features of these laws being. So in terms of important export laws, um, it's essential that there is a very comprehensive definition of asbestos and asbestos containing materials. Um, it is not necessary to individually list what all those materials may be. Um, we think it's necessary to make it clear that no threshold applies to determining if goods contain asbestos, meaning that any amount is prohibited. It is necessary to think about what the exceptions to the ban would be, and but again, they need to be considered very carefully. And we think it is important to have strong deterrence in place um, in, in, in terms of offences and penalties. So just very briefly, just going over what the Australian approach is. We do ban all type, all forms of asbestos um, and asbestos containing materials, anything that contains asbestos. No threshold applies, which means that zero means zero. There are uh, exceptions, but they're very narrow. They only apply to research display and analysis. And that's only in the case where permission actually has been granted. And the penalties from, for illegal importation are very high as well. So they, their asbestos is seen as a tier one criminal offence under Australia's Custom Act, which puts it in the same categories as, as drugs and, and guns. And you know, the, the amount there in Australian dollars uh, is very high and there's also um, imprisonment can, can apply. 
So then you also have public health laws. And there are a number of um, resolutions, World Health Organization resolutions that can underpin those laws. Um, again, you need to have um, definitions for asbestos and asbestos containing materials, which should be complementary to the ones that you have in, in other laws. Um, you have to be clear on the scope of those laws, whether they apply in the workplace, in the non-workplace or in both, um, what the prohibitions will be, what the duties may be of any authorised officers, and again, the offences and, and penalties. Um, the laws, um, I guess, in this, we see in this space would be sort of a really um, <coughs> as extensive as if, if this is going to be the main law where you enact the, the use prohibition, then the laws need to be very extensive. If, if not, um, they, they, don't, they don't need to be that ex extensive, which isn't the case in, in Australia. We have our public health laws that generally aim to prevent any activity that poses a risk to public health and safety, and that would include asbestos exposure. Um, but the public health laws in, in Queensland and Western Australia, two, two states in Australia, go a little bit further. So in Queensland, they do also regulate unlicensed removal. And in WA, there is actually a clear power for authorised officers to enter premises and to issue notice if they suspect that a person is creating a risk to health and safety by the incorrect management or disposal of asbestos con containing materials. We are actually recommending, my agency has been reviewing these laws throughout Australia, and we're act actually recommending that other jurisdictions um, revise their laws to adopt the approaches of um, Queensland and, and Western Australia. So another set of laws that can be used are environmental protection laws. Um, and there's the, on the screen, there's the inst international instruments that can underpin those laws. Um, again, you need the key features are similar to other laws, but importantly, unlike the import and export laws or public health laws, it may be necessary to set threshold amounts for determining things like when waste is considered to be asbestos waste. Um, in Australia, most jurisdictions set a, a threshold limit for when they consider waste to be asbestos waste, and for when a site is determined to be contaminated with asbestos. So in Australia's laws, there is a general environmental duty to prevent or minimise harm to the environment. Um, there's the duty to notify and also manage, manage sites that are contaminated with asbestos. Um, the mere presence of asbestos in a soil doesn't mean that the land is contaminated, um, but it does require ongoing management. Um, these laws are the laws that regulate the storage, transportation and final disposal of asbestos waste and also deal with the licensing of disposal facilities. And there are, um, and they also regulate importantly the legal disposing of asbestos waste. Um, so there are big um, pe penalties um, in Australia for the illegal disposal of, of waste. Oh, sorry. Now get on to work health and safety laws. And these are in Australia. These are um, the main laws that that regulate um, the control and management of uh, asbestos in Australia. So there's a number of, again, a number of ILO conventions um, that, can, that can be used to underpin these laws. So the Convention on Safety in the Use of Asbestos, Occupational Cancer Convention and the Occupational Health and Safety Convention. Um, the key features of these laws, again, are very similar to the, to the other laws, but there's should be additional things as well, like the duty to control exposure to airborne asbestos fibres in the workplace, the duty to identify and manage asbestos in the workplace, the duty to safely remove that asbestos from the workplaces if, if it's disturbed, and the duty to, to monitor the, the health and workers. Um, I've just clicked onto the next slide, which I will not go over all of this, but um, as you can see, this slide shows 
um, at a high level all the duties that are in, that are in Australian Australian law. Um, so it took many years to actually put this framework in in place, and it it, it has developed um, over, over time, um, and it is quite extensive. And I'm happy to to share um, these these details as as well. So. As you've seen, um, asbestos regulation um, cuts across many areas, um, which means a range of government agencies with specialist expertise need to be involved. Um, we really think that it's important that there is one agency, be that the agency responsible for work health and safety or occupational health and safety or environmental protection that leads the coordination in relation to the imposing of the laws, the implementation of the laws and the ongoing review of the various laws, um, which gets me back to why in Australia we have a national um, strategic plan. Um, and it sort of acknowledges that it's not feasible for one not be, to vest all the power in one non-regulatory or regulatory body um, that it's not feasible to invest that in one government agency, but the National Strategic Plan makes sure that we're all talking to each other and that we have a consistent and coordinated approach as well. Um, so just this slide is just because it, it does take a long time to get the laws and the supporting frameworks in place. Um, we think it is really important that initial steps um, start being taken um, as, as, as soon as you possibly can. Um, it is possible to, to start small and then to put bans in place and then work to mature the system. So on the slide is a few things that can be done. And the first thing is to institute those bans on, on importation and, and use. Because the important thing about introducing the importation ban means that then you, you shut the border to asbestos containing materials and you then need to just deal with the legacy that's in the that is in the country and then you then you stop the use of those materials within the country you can develop guidance to ensure that there is that safe management and removal of the legacy and as, as paul has said it's gone through what the key features of a code of practice need to be um, you need to train workers on um, the on working safely around asbestos, um, and that includes the, the removal of asbestos. Um, you need to establish procedures for, for the safe disposal of, of asbestos. Um, importantly, there needs to be an inspect inspectorate to ensure that the, the laws are, are, are enforced, because uh, you know, laws that sit there on the on the statute books that are that are not enforced well um, don't have much of an effect. And you need to start monitoring, um, monitoring the health of the workers. So those workers that, that still do asbestos in day-to-day -day work, they will still come across asbestos containing materials. So I just thought I would um, just explain um, why Australia is so committed to um, international assistance and um, getting bans in, in place elsewhere in the world. Um, and under our national strategic plan, we actually have a, a priority, which is international collaboration and leadership. And it, it does relate to the um, enormity of our, the legacy that we have here in Australia. Um, the Global Burden of Disease Study estimates that um, sadly over 4,000 Australians will die of asbestos related diseases um, this, this year. And we feel that it is important that we use um, our experience in a positive way to assist the campaign to, to ban production and trade of asbestos. So we think that we can share our experience of dealing with asbestos, our asbestos legacy in a safe way. Um, we can use the lessons learned from our experience to encourage um, to others to stop use and enact bans. Um, sorry, that just flicked. Um, we can provide advice on effective regulatory frameworks, and I've just given you a snapshot to, today of, of some of those, those frameworks. 
Um, we can provide advice on what laws to enact and then what codes and guidance are necessary to put in place to support those laws. Um, we do a lot of research um, so we can share the research so others do know how to safely manage their asbestos legacy. And we are more than happy to share any of our awareness materials that we develop to keep the community safe, including workers. And I'll just end by showing you some of those materials that we have um, developed um, for this year. Um, and this is for our National Asbestos Awareness Campaign in, in November. And um, as you can see there on, on the slide, you know, across Australia, we estimate that one in three homes contain, contain asbestos. So we are rolling this out with, with our stakeholders, both government and non-government stakeholders. And we, we provide these materials um, freely for agencies to use. Um, and I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much, <laughs> Justine. Uh, for your presentation, I think uh, I think we'll be reaching out more and more to you uh, for your good, uh, very good promotional and and uh, communications tools. Um, and uh, now uh, for uh, our final presentation, uh, Philip Hazelton, uh, he helps coordinate the camp, where he's actually the the coordinator um, of the Eliminated Asbestos and Related Diseases Union Aid Abroad. So. Uh, He's a, he's a person that really has a good handle on uh, worker health and safety issues. And, and uh, Philip, uh, um, he'll be talking uh, a little bit about the, the need for policy and regulatory frameworks uh, and specifically about worker health and safety and frankly, adverse impacts of asbestos containing materials. So um, Philip, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Very nice to, uh, to be here. Uh, just let me share my screen. Um, so yes, I'm working uh, for the Australian Trade Union Movement. I'm based in Cambodia at present, uh, but we're working across Asia and, and also some of the Pacific in raising awareness of the asbestos hazard precisely uh, because of the issues that uh, Justine was just talking about, about the legacy that we have in Australia. And the union movement in Australia is uh, you know, dealing with this issue all the time and we lose a lot of people every year uh, and historically so many uh, from this very avoidable uh, occupational health and, and safety uh, hazard. So today I'd like to uh, quickly go through a few things, a look at recent trends in general regulation uh, in the world uh, and then see what, uh, give you some idea of why workers particularly need protection from asbestos containing materials. Uh, and then once again, emphasize some of the uh, priorities for workers. On the slide there on the right, you'll see uh, the raw asbestos. Uh, that's the fibre that's mined in uh, only a very few countries left now that still mine asbestos because uh, so many countries have already banned it. Uh, but there are two or three countries that are still mining asbestos and exporting. And the photo below, of course, is the uh, shot of mesothelioma, which is one of the uh, cancers caused by asbestos inhalation into the lung. And uh, mesothelioma is the only known cause of this particular cancer is asbestos with more than 90% of cases of mesothelioma being able to be uh, linked to an exposure to asbestos. Okay, so in terms of recent trends in regulation uh, on, on occupational health and safety, uh, we can see that a little bit against the trend of the global situation. So globally, of course, in recent decades, there's been a move with the international trade situation and towards market economy to deregulate. Uh, so, you know, you can see a lot of pressure for economies to deregulate on trade, but in the area of health and safety and environment, in fact, we've seen the reverse. Uh, and there's a trend towards increased regulation generally and globally. Uh, which is interesting. Now, why would that be? Uh, one reason is that over time with research and with uh, organizing and with more information, uh, awareness on the issues around occupational disease risks uh, and safety and toxic exposures uh, and damage to the environment are better known and people demand protection. 
Uh, so particularly those at most risk, workers uh, who are at most risk uh, and also consumers who, who have these products in their house and understand that they are dangerous, are uh, uh, demanding more regulation protection in many countries. Obviously, we've got the increased focus on the environment as well in terms of protection and disposal of waste, which is such a big issue for the Pacific. In the case of asbestos in particular, uh, it's a difficult issue because unlike COVID, and of course COVID has also brought with us uh, to the globe a great increase in regulation as well uh, in the workplace, occupational regulation. So we can see the importance yet again of this type of, of regulation. But unlike COVID, asbestos takes a very long time to, to uh, come to the fore. So an exposure of asbestos fibre, which you can't really see, uh, but if you uh, exposure can take 30 to 40 years to develop uh, the lung cancer uh, or the mesothelioma or you know, a little bit shorter, but still for asbestosis and other diseases or other cancers. So there is a problem in terms of the long-term nature of, of uh, that process in terms of awareness. Uh, but that's also why it's more important to have the regulation because you can't see the danger. It's a silent killer. So unless government or unless there are regulations, then these things uh, develop and people are not protected. Also, the governments have looked at this over many decades and there has been research on, on asbestos for the last 100, more than 100 years. So this is why there's very clear evidence on this particular material. Uh, governments have looked at that as well and saw the cost of still using asbestos products, uh, which are sometimes you know, marketed as cheap and durable and strong um, against the longer term cost to people's health, to the environment because of the, the waste problem, because it's a toxic substance, uh, and also to the economy when you're paying compensation, you're losing uh, workers far too early from their normal work life. So there's a government cost there's obviously a personal health cost and there's a cost to the environment. So um, there's also, if you look at where the bans occur in the world, there's quite a disparity in regions uh, on this. So in Europe, 84% uh, of all countries in Europe now have a full import and use ban on all types of asbestos. Uh, and uh, that includes the chrysotile asbestos. Um, but in other regions, much less. So in Africa, Middle East, 25 to 25% of countries have a full ban, and most of those are in the Middle East. Uh, in the Pacific, we have so far just three countries who've got full bans uh, on asbestos import and use, and that would be Australia, New Zealand, and New Caledonia. So it's, it's great that uh, the 15 countries of the Pacific are looking at this and have committed to moving forward on an asbestos ban, and we really encourage that to happen. On the right hand side uh, is a, a graph of the global consumption and production of asbestos over the last 70 or 80 years. Uh, in the middle of the table there was about the 1980s and you can see uh, four and a half million tonnes of the fibre were, were mined and produced. Uh, and uh, about less than half of that was exported. Most of it was used in the countries that were mining it. When you look at the right hand side, which is 2019, uh, it's dropped a lot, so the, obviously the, the industry is dying. It's down to a million tonnes a year, but that's still a, a lot. It's mostly uh, now manufactured in Asia, which is why we have the campaign here, but uh, some of that is sent to the Pacific as well in the products. But you can also see that nearly all of it is exported now. So the countries that are producing it are not using it themselves. That also tells us something. Um, in terms of why we need protection from asbestos-containing materials, uh, we know from the World Health Organization estimation uh, that 50% of all occupational related cancers and deaths can be attributed to this one mineral, asbestos. Uh, and that equates to maybe 210 to 220,000 deaths globally every year uh, from asbestos exposure. Uh, I mentioned some of them before, but also some of the less well-known ones are ovarian cancer and cancer of the larynx are all been directly leads to asbestos exposure. The other issue we have with this particular mineral is no safe threshold of exposure. So uh, it's a bit like um, 
even one fibre technically uh, can lead to asbestos disease. Oh, that's quite rare, of course, but it's quite possible. So like smoking, uh, if you are a smoker, you increase the risk of your chance of getting lung cancer. It doesn't mean every smoker will get lung cancer. Similarly with asbestos exposure, uh, if you're working around asbestos products or in their manufacture, your chances of getting lung cancer are greatly increased, but it doesn't mean everybody will. So I think the main uh, workers at risk in the Pacific would include the construction workers, people building houses with asbestos containing materials, importantly, people pulling down old structures that have asbestos containing materials, workers who are transporting uh, or in terms of the products or the waste disposal, uh, emergency services who get called to typhoons or cyclones uh, and earthquakes and things where there's destruction. Uh, and those working in the power industry uh, and also anyone working in buildings that contain very old or broken asbestos uh, in terms of hospitals and schools. And as I mentioned before, it's a silent killer and takes many years to develop. Um, the only protection we have, because there's no cure for asbestos diseases that's totally effective. Obviously, medicine is, is developing all the time and sometimes very expensive cures can delay you know, the, some of the, the deaths. Uh, but for many of the uh, asbestos diseases, the prognosis is, is uh, very uh, one way. So the only protection against asbestos disease is actually preventing the exposure in the first place. Another reason why we need protection is that without government regulation, companies will not necessarily take into account these long-term impacts of, of their actions uh, currently on the health of their workers and the community and the environment. So the role of government then is to, uh, is to guide companies uh, when there are dangerous products uh, in relation to use or banning of use. Um, the other problem, of course, because you can't see it, if it's not labelled as a dangerous product, which is the case in many countries exporting these products, then workers are not aware of the risks of what they are handling. Uh, and therefore, whose responsibility is that to uh, warn the workers and protect the workers uh, from this type of exposure? Um, and a very common, the most common asbestos material in the world today is fibro cement roofing and sheeting uh, for corrugated iron roof, uh, but also some flat roof and flat sheeting for walls. But also it's possible to find in floor tiles, in the, in the felting under floor tiles. And of course, in friction products like brakes and clutch pads, uh, asbestos is heat resistant, so it's often used in friction products as well and some insulation products. But of course, there are many alternatives uh, for all of these products now. And uh, obviously, if Pacific, if you're importing from Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, there will be no asbestos because all those four countries have banned. Uh, but still in use uh, is uh, China uh, and many other Asian countries. Uh, who are so imports of materials from those countries may or may not uh, have the asbestos in them. And it's hard to tell by looking at the eye. There can be a cement roof sheet corrugated that is asbestos, but also now there's a lot that is not because, for example, in Thailand, while there's no ban of asbestos materials, 80% of the roof sheet products, the companies have themselves transitioned to non-asbestos because the consumers don't want to buy asbestos product. In Thailand, these things are labelled. So uh, in that case, uh, you can see a cement roof sheet and uh, you can't tell by the naked eye uh, whether it's asbestos or not. Uh, so labelling is important uh, to help consumers and workers understand the risk. Um, as I mentioned, there's no safe use of asbestos material either. The industry, the asbestos lobby and the asbestos industry who's desperate to sell their products still to the world as more and more countries ban. Um, uh, claim that can be used safely, but uh, there's very clear evidence around the world that this is not the case. 
there is a risk for workers and community, uh, in some cases from asbestos containing materials and obviously their manufacture. But in particular, very old or degrading, we call friable asbestos material is dangerous because uh, when it's old and degrading, then with the weather or uh, then it, the, the fibers are released from the old product. And so they become dangerous in the household if you've got very old roof sheet, for example. But also at any time, if you're cutting uh, the roof sheet or the material to fit to the walls or the roof, or you're drilling uh, or you're hammering holes in, the, in it uh, to fix it to different uh, materials, then you are potentially exposing uh, fibre. In Asia, and I think Pacific as well, obviously it's uh, people like to reuse and recycle uh, the old asbestos material from the roof. Okay, we can make a, a chicken uh, pen or, or a piggery pen or, or even do road filling. Uh, in Asia, it's quite common to fill potholes with uh, old asbestos uh, materials, which of course is very dangerous because people are driving over that product and the fibers are released. So that's another reason why um, there's a high risk. Uh, there's also a risk of exposure if, if the uh, products are transported unsafely, uh, removed unsafely from buildings and not disposed of correctly. And you know, according to the good practice standard, the best way to, to dispose is to bury. And of course, that's the challenge for the Pacific in terms of transport off, off the island. Okay, so I think this is just uh, closing up now, but basically, uh, we would strongly argue that uh, it's very important to at least take a few steps, even if you don't have a huge legacy like Australia. Uh, this is a, a solvable problem. It's an avoidable health risk uh, because there's no way you're going to get asbestos disease if you're not using the product. Uh, and there are so many alternative products available in the world. Uh, and I, as I understand, it's mainly a legacy issue in the Pacific, so that this, uh, it's mainly like dealing with the asbestos that's already there from past decades. But there would still be the potential for some materials coming in, new building products from countries that have not banned uh, to, to still contain asbestos. So the initial uh, national ban on import uh, and uh, of new asbestos uh, and asbestos containing material is a very important first step. Uh, and then as we've heard uh, from Paul and also Justine, uh, the guidelines and uh, codes of practice developed for safe removal and disposal. Uh, but also in the legal process, the uh, responsibilities need to be clear. Where, who has the responsibility uh, for the uh, potential exposure? And so in most jurisdictions, uh, the duties are on employers in the workplace to protect workers, uh, and that includes training on how to uh, deal with asbestos or how to identify asbestos materials, uh, undertaking the work to identify whether they are present, and also developing registers uh, for workers if they have been exposed to register that formally in the system uh, in terms of uh, potential future compensation. Uh, so they can be also be looking out for, for early symptoms of the disease. Okay, thank you very much. That's all from me. That's the uh, campaign that we are working on, Asbestos Not Here, Not Anywhere. And the feature there is the quote from the World Health Organization who have a very strong policy and guideline for countries around the world, for member states of the World Health Organization and the ILO. They have a step-by-step -step guide about how countries can best uh, eliminate asbestos disease. And the most efficient way, according to the World Health Organization, to eliminate asbestos disease is to stop using all types of asbestos. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, uh, for your presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, open up the floor now for any questions or comments um, uh, of the speakers. I know we have one on the chat, so let me, let me start with that one. Um, and uh, it says, while we progress through the development of the soft measures for asbestos management uh, and banning. Training is very much needed for our workers, responsible staff to collect, pack, and remove the existing asbestos containing materials on island, taking into consideration of the health and safety of the people exposed to the workplace, in the workplace. Um, and her question is, 
is there an easy way to identify and test for ACM? I'm basically opening up this to Justine Phillip or Paul, if you have uh, or could answer this question. Thank you. I'm happy to, to start with the um, identifying and, and testing. Um, but really, unfortunately, there's not an easy way to identify ACMs. I mean, as Philip said, you can try to do it by by sight, but then um, sometimes that you might see one material that looks that contains asbestos and another material that doesn't, and they look reasonable, it's almost similar. Um, and that's why how the Australian laws are framed is that if you don't know for certain that something um, contains asbestos, you need to presume that it does and treat it like it does. Um, you can go and, and get it tested, a sample tested from that material, but that requires taking it to a lab and getting it, te it tested. Um, so that's, that's the requirements in, in Australia. It's, it's really un, un, unfortunate that it, it does. It's so difficult to identify the material, material contains ACM. And we have recently put a challenge out and um, the Australian government is um, going very um, shortly, probably will announce some grants to some startup companies in Australia to see if there is a sort of a technology that can be used to do, do some sort of on-site um, identification. There is at the um, at present, there is on the market here in Australia, um, a, a, what they call a micro analyzer gun um, which can sort of be pointed and come up and see and tell whether something contains asbestos or not, but it's it's not accurate enough um, that satisfies the requirements um, under Australian laws. Um, just on the training as well, my, that training is really really important, um, and and you know training can can start now. You don't need to have a law in place that requires training to um, the training of workers for for the training to be provided to workers. It is. It's, it's part of discharging broadly work health and safety duties that, that workers are that are trained. Um, and there is lots of training examples of training packages around that could easily be adapted. I don't think there is any need to reinvent the wheel in, in that regard. Um, we actually have the problem that there is too much. We have too many work training packages in Australia, both accredited and non-accredited. And um, we have a problem in that regard with, with quality control. So, um, it is possible to put to put training packages packages together. Um, Phil, I don't know if you want to say more on training. Uh, no training. No. Um, well, I'd like to say just a couple of words real quickly. We're working uh, to do actually a research project to try to kind of define. You know, obviously we've been looking at trainings that we could um, uh, recommend to our, our Pacific Island nations. And, and like you, we're finding a plethora, <laughs> so yeah. many different trainings and some I'm sure are not uh, of, of much value and others are incredibly valuable. So we're actually gonna hopefully put out a publication, uh, do the research and put out a publication um, on that. So so yes, it's a, it's a critical issue. Um, Philip or Paul, any, any uh, comment on that? Yeah, I can add a bit more. So, I mean, I think the way, I mean, you can, uh, if you're buying products, you can probably uh, check in terms of the source of that material. So if it's coming from a country that's banned asbestos, you've got a fairly good chance it won't be. Um, you can also check, look at the brand name of some substances to check. So some companies, uh, even in Asia, uh, are, are promoting themselves as asbestos free. So that would give you some hope that they, they could be. Um, the actual process that we uh, that is used to identify is the polarized light microscope, which is an expensive uh, microscope. We have, with a C as help, provided that facility to the Cambodian government. So now they have a laboratory here that can do their own testing. But I think the uh, there's quite a lot of that uh, use here. Um, so that's one. But in in uh, the profile work we did here in Cambodia last year, we also sent about 100 samples of materials to Australia, to the Brisbane uh, laboratory. And I mean, they charge about you know, $30 or something Australian uh, per sample. Uh, and that can be one way if you're looking at like a, uh, if you've got time to do that and you've got, to, you know, they're able to do that. So that worked very well. And the information that comes back from that is very comprehensive. Um, 
the gun that I think Justine talked about uh, that doesn't fit the Australian standard, it's, it's, it, it comes up with a result of asbestos or not. There's only one word I think that comes up largely. So it doesn't give you a lot of information about uh, uh, what might be there, but also it's not so reliable, but presumably and hopefully that sort of technology will keep improving uh, and maybe of some use in the future in the Pacific as well. Okay, thank you, Philip. Um, and we have a, one, uh, a, an additional question, um, uh, which is uh, from our friends in Kiribati. Uh, does uh, the Moana Taka partnership uh, or can the Moana Taka partnership assist in shipping asbestos materials uh, out of uh, Pacific Island countries for safe disposal? So I think the short answer is yes, but I don't know, Tony, I know um, maybe you could give folks a, just a short thumbnail on the Moanataka partnership and, and, uh, and how they would go about shipping asbestos utilizing that tool. Sure, Lance, thank you for that. Um, so, the Mona, so the Moanataka partnership is a, <laughs> the Moanataka partnership is a uh, sort of like a private public partnership between Swire Shipping and SPREP. The partnership was formed in 2018 and uh, it was initially for three years. So it comes to an end at the end of this year, but with all uh, things that are happening around the world, we don't see it finishing off. We see it continuing for the next near future. Um, the way that it works is that uh, there's a format in, or, or rather there's a protocol to apply for the use of the Monotaka partnership. Basically you apply for the partnership to spread um, as the custodian of the process. We evaluate whether it, it, whether it meets the criteria, which is uh, non-commercial or non or low value waste, and whether it's uh, the shipment um, is within the Moanataka or rather within the Swire shipping network within the Asia Pacific. Uh, just those two simple things. And uh, once the process is checked by us, we give the go ahead for Swire to program it into a shipment. And that's it. Thank you, Lance. You bet. Okay, uh, we have about, uh, what, about uh, five minutes left? Okay, um, so I would like actually, uh, before we uh, 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 stop, I do wanna ask Paul, and I think this is, is kind of directed at you, your uh, being the fact that you're uh, there in Nauru uh, and, and work with the Chamber of Commerce and are pretty heavily involved in the kind of the business side of asbestos abatement work uh, there, at least in Nauru. Uh, I am curious to know what, what kind of opportunities or employment advantages are there in the creation uh, of the code of practice or a code of practice. If you could talk a bit to that, I know there's potentially some opportunities there from the business end. Thank you, Paul. Sure, thanks, Lance. Um, a couple of areas, we have had some initial training. There was some, um, documentation prepared oh, probably be three years ago now by John, o, John O'Grady, who I think you'll know, um, who's been involved in asbestos removal in the Pacific and writing policy and also in um, New Zealand and I think in the Philippines. He prepared some papers for the then government of the day uh, it's never really gained much traction. So it is an issue that is very important. I was interested to just hear that um, converse conversation and I wrote some notes down. I'll be writing to you actually, Lance, on the potential for removal um, via the SWIRE um, arrangement and just having some contact. I mean, we have a serious problem of it just building up and up, being stored not properly. Um, I mean, I have containers where we've just got them locked locked up. In fact, work we did for DFAT Australia, they have the keys for the containers that asbestos material we removed from um, properties of theirs that they wanted upgraded because there's no, um, full way of removing it that they are happy to 
um, see it under see it undertaken, they've committed to literally locking it up until there is a process. So it's an issue that I'm pleased to be able to talk about it because it's something that must be looked at. And I think it uh, we're not going to get the full buy-in of removing asbestos from both use as a building material until it can be seen that there is a long-term answer for the total eradication and removal from the islands. I can only speak for Nauru, but I'm sure it's probably a similar situation in some of the other countries. So that is that long-term process that, that needs to be part of this continuing discussion. Um, but I think it's very important. We're looking at regulation, we're looking at processes, we're looking at worker safety. Um, but as well as that, we need to look at the full removal under some framework that um, is, is in the not too distant future to start bringing some processes into place here. Yeah. Thank you all very much. I think uh, our presenters very much. Um, you know, if you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to enter them into the chat or uh, email uh, me um, uh, or uh, any of the presenters as well. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to moving ahead on the asbestos issue. Thank you all very much for your time and good day.